Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. And we are back after taking a vacation. I went to Martha's Vineyard for my birthday. Joyce joined me there. We had a great time. It was just fabulous weather and great fun and really enjoyed. ate a lot of lobster, a lot of lobster, a lot of lobster. <laughs> That's the best part. Um, so we're back. We'll be doing webinars again this fall. Um, it will be on an irregular basis at this point. Um, and if you have guests that you'd like us to see if we can't wrangle, because that's kind of the issue right now, um, just pop me an email at wendy at wendymurdoch.com and we'll see if we can get them on the show. Tonight, of course, is my friend, Dr. Joyce Harmon. And of course, many of you are familiar with Joyce because she's done, I don't know how many webinars, which we are so grateful for. Um, and tonight we're gonna to talk about blanketing. So I am just gonna turn it right over to Joyce and let her get right started into the topic. So welcome, Joyce. Thanks so much for doing this. Uh, you're welcome, Wendy. And, and this is actually a really good time to do this, except that I'd be willing to bet that half the people that haven't showed up are going to be looking up this webinar in December. But <laughs> those of you that are here are proactive because a lot of the decisions that you might want to make, you actually might want to start making now, getting ready for winter, because there are issues with clipping. There are issues with, with how you're going to manage your winter riding and what are you really going to do? And, uh, and Wendy has a wonderful, hairy, very <laughs> warm-blooded uh, draft cross who sweats at the drop of a pin and has a lot of fur, always has. And he was probably from Canada originally, so he has a good reason to have a lot of fur. And so this is the time of year that you actually really have to start deciding how you're going to manage your winter. How much riding are you actually going to do? What kind of shape is your horse in now? What kind of shape do you want them in? And, and trying to be realistic, knowing that life is going to happen. So whatever you plan now might change later, but if you have serious plans for riding all winter, you may seriously need to consider clipping. Once you've made that decision to clip, then you have to start managing the idea of blanketing, shelter, all those kind of things. Are you re really going to ride this winter? That's always the big- Always ask me that question every winter. <laughs> yes, because his blankets are big and heavy. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, so if you make a decision to clip now with this pie in the sky idea that you're going to ride in the winter, then, and it's possible the weather will get either so bad or so wet or so slippery that you really end up not riding for a good legitimate reason. Or life may happen and you look outside and it's 20 degrees and the wind's blowing, your horse is totally happy, but you're like, no, I'm not gonna ride. <laughs> and so sometimes the best laid plans change and that's okay. But once you've made a decision to clip, you are committed to a different level of care for your horse. So, um, if you're going to, as, as you're thinking about all of these things, you have to ask yourself, how cold is my climate really? So years ago, a friend of mine came down from Vermont. Now, Vermont is a cold climate, especially back in the 90s. Maybe not quite as much now, but it's still pretty cold. So she went around um, she was a vet up there. She went around um, riding around with me. And this was December. This wasn't even the middle of winter. And her comment was, your horse, your people's horses have more blankets on in December than my people's horses have on in February. Wow. So my climate here, yes, it does get cold. And 
we do very often ride through the winter. It's often very possible to ride through the winter. In Vermont, sometimes you really can't ride well through the winter because the footing is so bad. So some of those horses never need to be clipped. But then we take a drive down the coast and let's go down to Aiken or into Southern California or Arizona. And you still find a lot of blankets on horses. So these Vermont horses and Maine horses and New England horses, it's still a horse. It grows fur. The fur is actually designed to keep horses warm. I don't know if I had, I have a, yes, I have a good picture here. So yep, I'm- I made your co-host so you can share your screen. Okay. So here is, here is a horse with fur that is working. Do you see melted snow on top of this horse? Mm -mm. No. Now, eventually that, that snow will melt. But the snow is coming down. The horse's skin is warm, but the outer layer of fur is cold. It's cold enough that that snow is not melting. So we walk up to this horse and we pat it. We touch the outside of this fur and it feels cold to the touch. Yeah, it is cold because the air temperature is cold. But the inside of the horse is toasty and warm. And this horse is standing out in the snow. I mean, there's a shed. I can tell you there's a shed 50 feet away. This horse is my horse. She is not standing in the shed. So she's standing outside. She's happy to eat hay. She's happy to, to be outside. She's warm. She's comfortable. And in general, horses are healthier if they're outside. And many of these New England horses do adapt to the that cold very, very well. And they can have, they'll grow a little bit of extra fur than the horses down in Aiken, but um, they will also adapt to the cold. Now we know that these first cold days of winter, we're freezing, right? Because we're not accustomed to it. But give us two weeks of cold weather, say, you know, 30 degrees or free around freezing, or maybe 35, just above freezing. And then throw in a 50 degree day. We strip down to our t-shirts because those two weeks of cold adaptation have adapted us. We have adapted to that cold. And so now we perceive 50 degrees as comfortable. Right now, we're wearing a jacket at 50 degrees because Two weeks ago, it was 80. And so we're not adapted to the 50 degree and we're certainly not adapted to the 20 degree. This is right here around my area. Some of you probably already have 20 degrees. But, um, and some of you are still in 80 and 90 degree weather. And you've got a little bit more time to make your decisions than those of us who are having frost and, and facing our cold weather. So horses generally are healthier if they live out. It is perfectly fine for them to look just like this. It is perfectly fine to have them have icicles. See the icicles on the bottom of her belly? Oh yeah. Where little bits of little bits of water have trickled down that have melted. And then they refreeze because the air is so cold that anything in the air is frozen. And they can have quite long icicles. They don't care. The icicles aren't even touching anywhere near touching their skin. So they're fine. We walk out and we see the icicles and we kind of panic. They're warm. Now, it's actually harder for the horses when it's 35, just above freezing, 35 and raining. Yeah. 
and they actually get cold, wet skin, then they get cold. And on that kind of a day, this horse would be in the shed. She's not going to be standing out there. She's going to be trying to get dry in the shed or running around the pasture trying to get warm because she will legitimately be cold. So what we want to do is start thinking about our plan for the winter. How much outside time are they going to have? And there certainly are areas up in Canada where it really can get too cold for horses to really be, for our, our, our tame um, horses that are accustomed to being indoors at least part of the day. It can, be, it can get to be way too cold for horses to be completely outside. As, but if they have shelter, they will be fine. So what kind of shelters do you, what kind of shelter do you have? How much time are your horses going to spend outside? And how much riding are you actually going to do? Those are all questions to ask yourself. Are you now, trying, aren't there some yeah. horses that just don't grow enough coat versus like your horse and my horse that grow a lot of coat? Yes. And as at the other question to ask, and as we're asking these sort of preliminary questions is, is my horse a cold horse or a warm horse by nature? So do I go outside all the time and find my horse standing in the sun all winter long and even half of the summer, if not much of the summer? Those horses are cold internally, and many of our very old horses are cold internally. They need, we're, in nature, horses wouldn't live to be 30 for the most part. They would have been eaten by a mountain lion a long time ago. So just like if you go into your grandmother's apartment and the thermostat is at 90 degrees, and she has a sweater on and she's saying, it's quite chilly in here, my dear. And you're going, ah, you know, I'm roasting because you're not at that phase of your life yet where you're cold internally. In Chinese medicine, the older animals become yang deficient, which is deficient in heat, in internal heat, mm. just as old people do, and old dogs. So they're all going to lay by the fire. We're going to put on the extra clothes. And those horses, if they are very cold natured, they will need more temperature support in cold climates. And the older they are, the more likely they are to need that. They don't need to be wasting calories attempting to stay warm. They need to be using those calories to, to maintain their body weight, especially many of the older horses. We do have individuals who don't grow enough hair, but I think a lot more of it is their cold or warm nature. Because I've seen thoroughbred brood mares that have hardly any coat that you can see and they're standing out there with icicles hanging off of them because mm. they're by nature they are very warm and I've seen plenty of thin-skinned Arabs the same kind of way and you look at their coat and you go well they don't have a whole lot of coat and then you look at the pony next door that's got three inches of coat and you think well this this Arab should be cold and they're not, they're standing out there with everybody else. So it's much more that internal warmth or cold. On the other side of the coin, do you have a horse that is constantly in the shade, out of the sun, you put a blanket on, they will rip it off. They sweat easily. Wendy's horse yep. sweats. I mean, he'll, he'll sweat on a 70 degree day. On a 60 degree day. On a 50 degree day. Actually, he'll sweat on a 30 degree day. Yeah. And, and standing in the field, he's going to sweat much earlier than the other horses. So is your horse cold or warm natured? That's one of your, your preliminary questions here. Um, so we have a... Good. So these are, these are all the questions. Do you live in a cold climate? Does it actually get below freezing? If it doesn't, 
like in Aiken, it gets below freezing a little bit. I have even seen frost on the water buckets down in Ocala. But um, does it get below freezing? Not a lot. Those horses, for the most part, are not going to need blanketing unless you have shaved off all of their hair or most of their hair. Is there shelter from wind and rain? How much do they live in and out? Um, and this one, do you have time to dry their coat? If you're going to ride five times during the winter, get out a hair dryer and dry them off. If they sweat, they're going to, the thing is that if they sweat, they're going to be damp at the skin. Remember the horse with the snow on her back is not wet at the skin. She's, she has the snow on top. The 40 degree and raining day, they're wet to the skin. And if they sweat, the wet comes from the skin out. So their fur is wet. They will be cold. So you ride at four o'clock in the afternoon, work up a sweat, and guess what? Tonight's going to be 20 degrees. It's going to be cold. They are not going to dry very easily because they are wet at the skin level. And, and it, the moisture has to get out all the way through the hair and evaporate. But you can take a hair dryer and dry them. And if you're only going to ride a few times in the winter, that's a perfectly legitimate way to avoid all the hassles of blanketing and yet still have a few enjoyable rides. And then we talked about the very old ones, which are very likely to need blanketing. So the truth is horses are designed for cold. They are not designed so much for heat. Some of the breeds that are like the Florida cracker horse, the Arabian, there's probably some native breeds in Australia that are quite adapted for the heat. And those tend to be light bodied, light boned, thin skinned, thin coated horses. And not very big. The more body mass you have, uh, Wendy's horse. <laughs> the one in the back. The big one in the back here with the blanket. And notice that he has about the same amount of snow on the blanket as does the unblanketed ones. So here's the blanket and the unblanketed, and there's equal amounts of snow. So the, the fur is working as well as the snow. Horses, you will see them on a cold day, run around, have a good time. They are also, they're not just kicking up their heels for fun, Guess what? When you sweep the barn aisle and clean the stalls, you get warm too. So a little bit of exercise, you'll see them all run around the field a couple of times and then they go back to eating and they've just warmed themselves up. One of the things that we notice with our horses is on a cold day, they, they literally fluff their fur up with the little tiny muscles, fluff the fur out and that's like us wearing a down jacket. It's got lots of airspace in between. And on a hot day or when they're warm, that same fur lies down very flat. And this is where blanketing sometimes can drive you to drink because um, you are compressing their own fur. So then you have to substitute for their fur with a blanket. And putting a lightweight blanket on sometimes can be more detrimental than going ahead and giving them a heavyweight blanket because you need to get, you need to keep that fluff. And you'll see it as soon as you go out on a cold morning, you see them, they all look fluffy and, and, uh, and fresh because it sort of brings out, takes out the, takes the fur. So you're seeing a little bit of the inside color. So let's see what we have here. Our moisture thing is we talked about with the rain. Horses will use all kinds of shelters. You don't have to have a big fancy run-in shed. You go under some pine trees and there's often very little precipitation. 
but horses do need some kind of shelter. And especially if you have a small paddock area, they can't necessarily choose where they wanna be that will be out of the wind and out of the moisture to a certain degree. If you have 50 acres and some hills, you'll find that they have preferred places to hang out where the wind is not, where the sun is shining the warmest. And you'll find them position their body in a way to soak up the maximum amount of warmth as the sun comes up in the morning or as it's going down in the evening. The one thing that we have to think about here is shivering. We see horses shivering and we tend to panic. Oh my God, they're cold. What do you do when you're cold? You shiver. Guess what? In a little while, you quit shivering because shivering is actually muscle contractions, kind of like working, kind of like exercising. You warm up, you increase your circulation and you warm up your body. So shivering by itself is not a bad sign. Yes, they are chilly, but if they can get out and run around or will, I don't, I don't remember whether it's on the slide or not, but Eating hay, long stem fiber, also generates internal heat. And so the sun comes up, they're maybe a little bit shivery in that early morning hour. They tuck into some nice fresh hay, they get a little bit of sun on them, they're fine. Now, a horse that is standing in the corner of the paddock or standing by the gate, just shivering away and is not getting warm, that's an indication that they've either, usually they've gotten too wet or you do not have enough blanketing for that horse's metabolism or their age. Some of the really old horses can get very cold and they're not going to warm up by themselves. You really have to, you've got to get some, some covers on them. So let's see, let's see what we have here. Wind is another factor in it. And some people, some people are in windy environments where the wind is intense, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles an hour wind. You have dust issues with that and you have to watch their eyes. They, they usually will need a place to get out of the wind. And that can be a, a tree break a bunch of trees, a bunch of brush, um, a little patch of woods can be just as effective as a run-in shed. And if you have put the run-in shed in the wrong part of your pasture, your horses won't even go into it because it'll either be too hot, too windy, facing the wrong direction, and you have this beautiful run-in shed and they won't use it. And uh, that's that's one thing to think about. If you have not yet built your fancy run-in shed, watch where they hang out in the winter and watch where they hang out in the, the cold, wet weather because that's when they really need the shelter. And make sure the, the sun doesn't beat into it in the summertime because they also want shelter from the sun and the shade for, to keep the flies down. If you don't have a good shelter, this is another time where you might end up substituting a blanket for that shelter so that they can stay outside. You don't have to lock them in a stall, but they have, they're, they're essentially carrying their turtle shelter around with them. And then they can be outside and be very comfortable. Um, so somebody's asked about older horses that can't chew hay. So if hay is a way for them to, that long stem hay for them to warm up, if you have a horse that can't chew long stem hay, what do you do? Um, you, you can, I feed a lot of soaked um, hay pellets. They are not as effective at warming the horses. And a lot of the horses that are on, that don't have good teeth, Hay, hay pellets, soaked hay pellets are a fabulous way to get forage into them. But you will probably end up having to blanket those horses more because it's the breakdown of the, of the real fibery material that produces the most warmth. And if you're observant, your horses will eat more on a very cold night 
or a very cold day. And so if you have kind of, go ahead. It's the fermentation. So when they're eating long stem hay, they've got that huge cecum. And so it's the fermentation that's creating the heat. Yep. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Like warm, warm. Yeah. <laughs> warm. <laughs> yes. They're making beer. Um, <laughs> and, and that is a, that is a piece of it. And if you observe, they'll, uh, if you're feeding hay and say square bales, they might eat a third again, as much as they would on a normal night. The same thing will happen with your round bales. You'll find that they go down a little bit faster in the really cold weather. Most of the time it warms up some during the day or that there's sunshine. Not every part of the country gets sunshine all the time, but the, the, they absorb that radiant heat from the sun, especially the darker colored horses or blankets that have a darker color. And so they don't need to, usually don't need to consume as much during the day as they do at night. Um, will they, chopped hay, that even in the uh, somebody's asking if the chopped hay, that's kind of an intermediate between long stem and mm -hmm. the pellets, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it will still be effective. It will still be helpful. Any kind of fiber digestion is helpful, but the long stem is the best. There are many horses though, that we are able to keep going with this chopped hay, hay, hay pellets, hay cubes, because we have that ability. And that's why our horses can live to be 25 and 30 and 35. We just have to step in and, and help them because this is not a natural part of their life. Mm. They're totally capable of living that long. But the reason that they don't live that long in the wild and the reason that, that 30 years ago they didn't live that long or 40 years ago, we didn't do their teeth all that well. And we didn't have all these tools to feed them with. We didn't have easy to digest food. So we have to come along and use extra blanketing and be more aware of keeping our, our horses temp, core temperature up. Can you measure core temperature? I mean, is that just using a thermometer? Using a thermometer, but you're not going to see, you will see horses temperatures tend to vary a lot more than ours. So on a cool morning or a cold morning, if you take their temperature, you're going to see, you could see 97 easily. And on a warm day, that same time of the morning, on a hot summer's morning, it might be 99. So there's, there is a lot more natural variability in that normal temperature, but it's as much their core and their internal heat that we're trying to affect. If you put a blanket on them on that cold morning, you're still going to find that low temperature in the rectum. Okay. So now the conundrum is to clip or not to clip. Unfortunately, if you're going to ride a lot, so the fox hunting people, the people who, who are seriously working, the people who have indoor arenas, who are going to ride all winter, um, you're going to have to clip. And the people who are going to end up in Florida or someplace in the south or the, the warm climate, say December, January, February, you're probably going to continue riding your horse through the kind of November, December time. You're going to end up clipping and you're going to have to clip when you go to that warmer climate because your horse will have produced way more coat than they can handle in that hot climate. So then the question is, okay, I'm gonna ride seriously, but how much do I have to clip off? you're going to go to a horse show, they want you to shave them bald. So go south, go, go someplace warm. It's, I, I think that it's hard on a horse to have their legs clipped, their head and neck clipped, their ears clipped, and be turned out, particularly their ears. If you're going to turn them out, they, you lose a lot of heat through the head. And if you can leave that part 
of them, their head and their ears unclipped, they will be more comfortable and they'll be more comfortable in the driving rain and the driving snow. And we now have blankets that go up the neck. So that isn't as much of a concern as it used to be. It used to really bother me to see horses with a bald neck and a blanket that just covered their body because they're losing a lot of heat. Yes, they seem to do fine, but ask yourself, is it really comfortable? The, the thing that you can do though, if you're not going to a horse show and if you're fox hunting, you can, you're still going to need to clip a lot because that's a tough sport. There's a lot of speed. Those horses are going to sweat a lot. And just to keep their skin clean, you're going to need to clip off most of their body hair. You might be able to leave some underneath the saddle, and, but you're going to have to take off most of the rest of it, but you can leave their legs and that actually protects them from the underbrush. But for a lot of other riding, if you're not having to show up looking a certain way at a horse show, but you're just riding and training, you can just look at where your horse sweats and clip holes in his fur. And no, it doesn't look absolutely perfect, but if you do that, you can end up blanketing a whole lot less because they have the blanket over their back. They have their blanket over their butt. They have a blanket on most of their neck, usually the upper part of the neck. The sweating is usually on the bottom part. And so you clip out the bottom part of the neck, the shoulders, wherever they sweat there, the flank, maybe a little bit of the belly. And you can get away with a whole lot less blanketing because you've left most of the fur and you just clip out what's important. A lot of the endurance people do it because they really don't worry about how it looks. They worry about the functionality and those horses very often, they live out much more. But then you don't have to mess with so much heavy blanketing heavy blankets to carry around, heavy blankets to wash, heavy blankets to put on tall, big horses. Um, and it's easier on them. Blanketing is not, we, we'll look at some pictures of blankets here because um, blankets are not necessarily that comfortable for horses. And they can contribute to making them stiff. They can contribute to making them sore. So the less we have to do, the better off the horses will be ultimately. The horses will grow their hair back. And sometimes you can get away with clipping in, say for the, you know, this time of year, October, November, the fall, and just clip once allows you to ride during the, the decent weather and then let the hair grow back. And maybe by about January, you can be mostly unblanketed except for the worst of the days. Some horses are really efficient at growing their hair back and you end up, you know, by, by Christmas time, you're ready for a second clipping or you can just about pull their blanket off because they, uh, they've grown back so much hair. But for many horses, they don't grow back enough to give that same degree of insulation as if they had unclipped hair. So once you've made that decision, then that's with you for the winter. And you can always take off more hair. Let's say you just clip out some holes and then you find that you're really riding a lot. We've had, we've had years in which we've had, you know, missed five days of riding in the whole winter because of maybe a bit too much rain or a little bit of ice. The rest of the winter has been fabulous for riding. So you end up riding more and you end yeah. up sweating more. So you cut more out. Um, so we, we have, um, it might be a little early for this, but somebody says, I'm bringing my first horse, an eight-year-old quarter horse to central New Hampshire from Pennsylvania. How will I know when he needs a blanket? I will ride five days a week all winter in an indoor arena. Um, you're probably gonna have to at least clip holes out from 
if you're going to ride five days a week inside, you're going to have to clip out some sweat areas and go ahead and blanket him accordingly. And one of the one of the ways to decide, it's like, how do you decide, well, now you made the decision or your horse needs a blanket, how do you decide how much blanket to put on? Mm. Um, there was the year I went to England to one of the big trade shows. The winner was, I think it was a Rambo blanket with a temperature sensor that goes to an app on your phone. And so it, there was a temperature sensor against the horse's skin or underneath the blanket. And you could look at your phone all day long and one <laughs> see, and see what your horse's temperature was under the skin. There's a really good old fashioned tool that you have on the end of your arm <laughs> called your hand. Um, and it probably works just as well and it doesn't make you crazy. So, Putting your hand underneath the blanket does give you an idea of that particular horse's degree of warmth or coolness under the blanket. If you put your hand under the blanket and it's toasty warm and almost a little damp, you've got too much blanket on because they're on the verge of sweating. If you put your hand under the blanket, well under the blanket, and it's quite cool and you don't feel that that toasty warmth especially in the horses that are clipped then you may not have quite enough blanket however this is where the horse's personal preference can come in the horses that are cold have a tendency to huddle up just like we do they might stand in the back of the stall the back of the shed they might stand at the gate waiting to come in but they have that that kind of huddled body language. And there are many times that we go out, we all communicate with our horses in one way or another. And you, you just kind of look at them and you know that they're cold. And some of it is their body language. Some of it is where they're hanging out. Though it is normal for them to be in the sun in the morning on a cold day. That's the, how they warm themselves up. That's, that's nature, that's how nature works. But then you can stick your hand underneath the blanket if you have it and give yourself a, a confirmation. So you put your hand under the blanket and maybe you already have two blankets on and this horse is still kind of huddled up. And I know some that are like that. So you go out and get, get the heavyweight blanket. Um, the horse that's moving north from Pennsylvania is already growing a good coat because Pennsylvania, though it's not as cold as it is up north, the, the day length and the temperatures are going to have produced a much better coat than a horse, say, that was raised in, in South Carolina or Florida and is now moving to New Hampshire. Because those horses, their first year, they will not have enough fur and you will need to blanket them. Um, it's a it's a big culture shock for their system, but they adapt. They adapt. So looking at body language, paying attention to how your horse is hanging out. And if it's a new horse, you don't always know what their normal behavior is, but you just observe is is he hunched up and is he trying to stand right next to the other horse? Is he, um, is he doing this kind of, you know, I'm kind of cold. Then you can add more blankets. The, the sweat thing we've talked about, we can use hair dryers, we can use heat lamps, wool coolers, Wool passes water through much better than the synthetics, but try to find a wool cooler that you can afford to buy. If you have one or if somebody find one in a thrift store, snag it because they really are nice. And you can put them under some kind of a heat lamp. You can put them in their stall with a good wool cooler on and they will stay warm because wool, remember, stays warm when it's wet. And you can go inside and have dinner and come back out and then finish 
drying them or blanketing them or whatever you need to do. It's thatching. Does anybody know what thatching is anymore? Thatching. Where, where you put a blanket on a horse, but you stuff hay underneath the blanket to make like an air pocket so that they... You, you can absolutely do that. Most, most people probably have lost that art. Yeah. But if you, let's say you only own, let's, let's say you live maybe here in Virginia or in, the, in, a, in a moderate climate that, yes, it gets cold, but you don't necessarily own a huge heavyweight blanket. And there's one of these Arctic things that comes down that drops the temperature to, you know, five degrees or zero degrees, and you have a, a horse that you know is going to need some extra. That is a perfect way to add you, what you've just done is added loft, which is right. airspace, by using some hay or straw. You can also use that to cool, I mean, to dry them as a, as a vent kind of a thing, because if you have, say, a thin synthetic cooler, you put some of the, you put some hay underneath that, you can absolutely increase your evaporation yep. and keep them warm at the same time. So that's a, that's a great sort of emergency or, you know, they, they were outside and they, their blanket is absolutely soaked. And the only dry blanket in the barn that's anywhere near usable is the lightweight. You could add some hay and underneath that, but it is certainly not commonly done here in the States anymore. Yeah. It works. Yes. Yeah. Just airspace. That's, that's how your down vest works. Yep. And the, a lot of these lightweight blanket materials are they're they are lightweight because they have figured out how to fill in that airspace with give it loft give it fluff so that we're holding in that warm air so i think we've already done that yep so we have blanket fitting do you want to wear a jacket that's too small all day and all night that's too tight in the shoulders so every time you go to lift your shoulder it pulls against your upper arm how are you going to feel how are you going to feel in two hours much less 24 right and if you if you wear things like coveralls you get that feeling by the end of the day very often. Your shoulders are tired of always having to lift the coverall up while you're grooming your horse. And the taller your horse is, the more you have to lift your shoulders way up in the air and sort of lift that whole nice insulated Carhartt coveralls. They weigh a ton. Um, ski, ski outfits are actually much lighter weight than the old car hearts that we tend to wear around the barn. And the new materials are much lighter weight than the old canvas things that we used to have. But having said that, they still have to fit. Yeah, and somebody made the comment that her theory is that we don't move as much in a winter coat and maybe, and she's thinking maybe horses don't move as freely in a coat either, in a blanket. Absolutely, absolutely. They just don't, They and they can't. And you'll see, I see all day long, horses with tight shoulders and tight withers. I should have some pictures here. Um, that shoulder, if you just watch how much it moves in a stride forward and back, it has to have that much freedom to reach forward and back in that blanket. So this is the most common blanket fitting issue. You look at this neckline. Y'all can see my, my mm -hmm. um, cursor. Yep. So you look at this neckline and it comes way down onto the shoulder right here. 
So every stride, when this horse moves his leg forward, oops, oops, every stride, that is acute pressure. That's a pressure over a small area right on top of the shoulder. But guess what? This is high pressure here, but it's hanging off the withers. So as this leg is pulled forward, there's pressure on the shoulder blade. I mean, on the shoulder itself, but there's also pressure on wherever this blanket lands on the withers. So it doesn't matter if it lands on top of the withers, behind the withers, that pressure is going between these two points. So horses get incredibly wither sore. And a really good thing to do is to stretch their withers out after they've had the blanket on. So you just reach up across their withers and rock it back and forth, pull it towards you just in a nice long stretch, and then go and do the same thing from the other side. Nice, long, easy stretches or a little bit of shaking to just kind of loosen it up and wake it up. Now, a blanket like this doesn't fit at all, but I have a picture of what you can do to make an awful lot of these bad blankets fit. A lot of times the blankets that do this are because they are too big. Sometimes it's because they are not designed properly. So this one is not designed properly because it has a big wide open neck and it's going to sag down across the shoulder blade. But some of our, what, what I find sometimes interesting is in say one blanket line, and I've seen this particularly in the Rambo line, but it can happen in any blanket line. You, you need an XYZ size in your heavyweight and your medium weight blanket, and you come to your lightweight or your sheet without any fill or puff in it, oh. and suddenly you have a blanket that's too big. So it's kind of like taking the liner out, and I'm not quite sure why they size them that way, but make sure that all sizes of your blankets are fit in the same kind of way. And I can't tell you how many horses I see with wonderful fitting, big, heavyweight blankets. And then they put a lightweight sheet underneath that fits like this. Uh, yeah. And it's like, you know, you just defeated, you just spent however much money you spent on this perfectly fitting blanket that will really keep your horse warm and then they can't walk. So when the blankets are too big or the neck design is wrong and it has that big wide open neck, this is the cheap fix. And it is, it is a miracle fix. You don't have to go out and buy another blanket. About well, buying a new blanket doesn't ensure it's gonna fit in the neck. That's right. <laughs> that is right. <laughs> So, and so many of them don't. And uh, you just take and make, take a pinch right about halfway down. And you see it's making a dart. And you sew that down. And if you have a good blanket repair person, they can do it. If you have anybody who has big, heavy sewing equipment, you can sew it by hand using, you can, you just have to sew it with something strong because they're going to put a lot of pressure on this area. You can't just safety pin it together. It's got to be sewn. But what that will do is it'll pull the blanket forward because you've shrunk the neck up. So it has to come up on the neck. And then you look at the picture on the right and see how this now has almost a puffy area out over the shoulder. It is no longer touching the shoulder. It's, it is contacting across the top where there's plenty of space for it, but this hard bone here now actually has no pressure on it at all. This, will, this simple fix will 
will correct half the blanket fitting problems out there, if not two thirds of them. And it will even take a blanket that's a little bit too big for a horse and make it usable. So you don't, again, have to go out and buy a whole nother blanket. You might have to have a two inch dart in it. That's okay. The, the dart is gonna do nothing but give you, give you space right here. And that's for all your blankets and sheets. Now, lots of blankets these days have gussets built into them. And this is a great idea. But the gusset has to be in the right place. I was going to say, are these in the right place? <laughs> mm, that's why I have them as pictures. <laughs> yeah. Because you can see where the tension in this blanket is. The gusset, the gusset's not going to do really any good at all because the horse, is, the horse needs to move this shoulder blade. You'd have to take and put it and see how far back. There's the horse's shoulder blade sticking out. This, if you took this and now put a dart in it and pulled it way up here, then there'd be lots of room for the leg. But as it is, you can see that all the pressure is right where you're trying to avoid it. And if anything, I think sometimes it makes it almost worse. Yeah. There's a tremendous amount of pressure there. So on this one, it's a little bit better. It's a little bit higher up. But in reality, if you're going to sew this kind of a gusset in, you almost have to come really high to free up this part of the shoulder. Cause you can still see how the wrinkles are headed right down, right across that shoulder joint itself. So great idea, but the execution is not always in the right place. I haven't seen every now and then, I've seen one where they actually put the gusset in far enough forward that it really does a lot of good. And I have seen these you type of thing, you put a dart in it, and then this shoulder actually has quite a lot of room to- uh, That of course play. has a really long withers. Yes. Yes. Yes, dart on both sides. Yep, because you yep. have to alleviate both shoulders. Oh, yes, yes, yep. There are some blankets coming out with some adjustable necks and all kinds of adjustments. And these can be a good idea, but you've still got to apply the same principle or you end up with the same issues. So the way that this is adjusted here, all the pressure on this is really right across the shoulder blade again. Yeah. By really shortening up, by using this, making a gusset and really shortening up the neck and see how much farther forward this is on the horse's neck. It's way up here now. We can make use of this gusset and free up the shoulder. So, and there I've seen some, they actually have a piece that wraps all the way around and it hooks on the hooks up by the withers that can work i've seen it work and i've seen it misadjusted hmm. so the principle is the same and if it's a really cool idea and it doesn't work it's just a really cool idea and might make a good dog bed and it also might fit another horse really well because the horses the way horses are built up front has a tremendous difference on what brands fit. So some of these horses have big, really big, like quarter horse type of really broad shouldered. And sometimes on those really broad shouldered guys, you actually go looking for a quarter horse kind of show blanket because those guys don't want to see one hair out of place. And they've got these big shouldered horses. So they have all kinds of darts sewn in so there's no pressure on that shoulder. And for your big wide horses, sometimes you need something like that. And you can take a horse that measures 
82 inches or whatever and you go and you order you say, oh this is a really cool blanket and you put it on and it's way too small or way too big like so many things in clothing you get a size x jean pair of jeans and it won't fit you at all but it fits your friend who happens to wear the same size jean because in the same shoes it's the same thing there's there's not any real standardization and so much of it has to do with how it's going to come over the shoulder and how much roundness your horse has to fill in the blanket because the rounder the rounder the butt the rounder the shoulders the bigger the blanket for their size that you're going to need to really cover them properly a real thin little narrow thing might be long it might be a very long horse but it doesn't have a whole lot of body to take up that blanket and so you suddenly find yourself with a blanket that's too big So here's here's the um, the sheet issue. Mm. So this this blanket over here on the right is still too big in the neck. It needs a nice dart there, but you can see the incredible amount of pressure going right across this horse's chest with its sheet. The sheets maybe to keep the blanket clean. Um, I don't know. Or double, you know, added a layer. But you can see that flesh bulging over the. Yeah. Straps. So do you want to, and, and any brand that shows up here is irrelevant because it's how it fits your horse. And so you could have this same blanket fit your horse magnificently, but don't do this to them. <laughs> it just is torture. So when we're, we're looking at the rear end of a blanket, to kind of decide how does this blanket fit. Um, and you see all these nice darts they put in the rear end? Why don't they put them in the shoulder? Yeah. Um, they do in those quarter horse, the fancy quarter horse blankets. Um, we want the blanket to cover, to come down to cover their tail. Now they make blankets that have tail covers. They make blankets that have nice wraps underneath, especially for these horses that are fully body clipped. Their, their stomachs can get cold. So if you really need to keep them warm, it's really nice to have that coverage over as much of their clipped body as you can. Horses that still have a lot of their fur and you've just done a trace clip along their side or you've just clipped out holes where they sweat, they may not need all this fancy stuff at the back because they've got their own fur that will also work. But you want your blanket to come pretty much to their rear end. And if it ends too far forward, the wind is gonna get up underneath it and it's not going to be as warm. It's not gonna be as accomplishing as much as you want. And if it's that short here, it is likely to be tight across the shoulder. Mm -hmm. Conversely, if it's hanging way off the back here, it's likely to be way too loose up in the front. Now you could, this is where you could put a dart in and pull the blanket up because it, when you put that dart in, it will pull the blanket up. And sometimes you end up with a blanket that's a little bit too short. I would rather have a blanket that's a little too short then have a blanket that has pressure across the shoulders because that is going to bring you a, that horse that's stiff. They're harder on their feet when they aren't able to stretch out. So they land harder on the ground. They're likely to be more stiff and sore in their front feet and their ankles, their shoulders, their withers. And then you want to go out and have a nice ride. Mm -hmm. And over time, this is going to contribute to them being not as sound. So blankets, when we first put the blanket on and we bring this brand new blanket and we put it on our horse and we shift it around and we buckle it up and it looks perfect. It tells us absolutely nothing because that horse hasn't moved in the blanket. 
other than it's the right length, that horse needs to go out and move. And if you are testing a blanket, you might even want, and, and you have the opportunity to return it if it doesn't fit, you might even want to put a sheet underneath it to keep it clean and go stick them on the lunge line for, or turn them out in the paddock and chase them around and have them walk and trot and canter and see what the blanket has done after they've done that. Has it slid back and is putting pressure on them? A lot of times it is. It fits beautifully when you put it on at feeding time at night, turn them out and you come back in the morning and they're strangled. Once you have put the blanket on, you can help test that by pulling on it. Pull it back as far as hard as you can and see what happens to your shoulders because that's probably about where it's gonna end up after they've exercised. So pull it back and see if the shoulders get tight. And if they do, you better go put them on the lunge line and make sure that you have it right. A general safety tip, undo your belly buckles first and your chest buckles last. Has anybody had a horse spook and walk out of their blanket, but they get tangled up in the leg straps? So undo your leg straps first, if you have leg straps, then your belly, then your, then your chest. Right. Because horses getting tangled in leg straps is not pretty. And especially if they end up dragging the blanket behind them. So these guys were having fun in the snow and they're very happy and they're warm and they play. And one's clipped and one's not. One's blanketed and one's not. There's no one perfect answer and there's no one perfect answer that will be the same year after year. It'll change as they age. If they, let's say they've been really sick in the fall and they've lost some weight. They've never needed blanketing in the past, but this year maybe they do. And then the ones that get old on us and we go out there and they're standing there shivering and it's like, yeah, but you've always been warm blooded. Yeah, but now you're 29 and you're cold and that's okay. So anybody got any other questions um there is one question from the person that's moving their horse to new hampshire and she says if the new hampshire quarter horse is outside all day is it better to leave him outside overnight as well um he will have an indoor stall too absolutely he can be outside there's no reason he can't you may find he may not know how to handle or be as comfortable with two feet of snow on the ground you want to make sure that he does have a shelter and pay attention to his behavior. And if he's happy, snow and cold is usually not an issue. It's the, it's the wet and the damp. And unfortunately, some of our Northern states and Northern parts of the country now are having more days in which you'll have, you might have snow on the ground, but then you have 40 degrees and raining, which turns everything to ice. Yeah. And then you get stuck bringing them in for their own safety. And that is definitely something the Pennsylvania horse probably hasn't seen nearly as much of, but some of the Canadian horses now, they're having to really deal with a lot of ice, which just was not an issue before. Um, so somebody's commented, so appreciate this info. Just when you think you know something, you realize what you don't know. Thank you so much. Um. You're welcome. It, this is. It's, it's interesting. This is one of the more, um, more requested talks, I guess, or more re people really want to know about this. And, and every time I publish something in my newsletter in the fall or around this time or a little bit later, I get more comments about this because there isn't one perfect answer. Here's a, here's a great conundrum which, where there really isn't a good answer. You have to be at work. You have to be on the road at 530 in the morning to get to work. It is 15 degrees out. There's wind blowing. 
the temperature is supposed to go up to 50 during the day or it in the spring and fall. Sometimes it'll go up to 60 or even 70. And this is where you really do not want that temperature sensor blanket that you're looking at your app on the phone at work <laughs> because you might not get a lot of work done. And there is not a great answer to that. You're going to have to, because the, the horse that's blanketed heavily at 530 in the morning is going to be sweating, likely, when it's 50 degrees with a bright sun coming down on them. And so it's more picking what, what that horse, is that a warm horse or a cold horse? If that horse tends to be a cold horse, he's probably better off sweating at noon than if he is a naturally warm horse, he's better off probably being turned out so he can run around and get warm and then be comfortable at 50 degrees in the middle of the day. The cold horse will probably be happy to sweat a little bit, but he does not want to be turned out. And that really cold natured horse is likely to go outside and just stand here like this and not really move around because he's too cold. So it's kind of, there, there, is, there is no perfect answer. Think about what makes your horse the happiest. Yeah, it, the, I think the hardest is when the temperature fluctuations are, you know, 30, 40 degrees in the day. And it's so, it's so difficult if you can't get to the barn to be able to pull that blanket off. Um, um, yeah. That's probably the most, the most challenging. Yeah. And there is isn't there is no great answer to that. I mean, the best answer is if they're not clipped, they'll deal with it. Right. But if they're clipped or they're old and or they need a blanket for all the reasons that we've talked about, then you just you have that as an issue. Right. All right. Does anybody else have any more questions for Joyce? Um, if you do, just pop it in the chat or the Q&A. Um... Joyce, if you want to unshare your screen there. Oh. I, although I love looking at Al. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fun picture. It was a great picture. Yep. Um, it's an old picture because it's, mm -hmm. it's back with the old round veil feeder. It's just, yeah. It's an old picture, but it's great. Oh, yeah. It's a cool photo. All right. Um, great. Then if no more questions, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Just remember, this will get posted up on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Tell your friends to watch this if they have any questions about blanketing their horse. Um, and thanks, Joyce, so much for joining us. And we'll be back. I'll pop out another email when we have some more webinars coming up. Um, and like I said, do pop me an email at wendy at wendymurdoch.com if you have a topic or a guest, and we'll see what we can do about getting them on. Um, and now that COVID is kind of over, it's not, it used to be so easy to get guests because they were all sitting around home. Now it's a little bit trickier, but we'll keep harping on them and drag them in here and get you more information. Everybody wants to get out and ride. Yeah, really. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. We'll see you next time. Take care. Thanks, Joyce.